is uh, Paul Diermeyer, and uh, um, he is a professor at uh, the George Mason University. Um, Paul is an uh, expert on the role of the uh, land surface in the climate system. Uh, and uh, he's interested in the development and application of land surface model as he studies the impact of land surface variability on the predictability of climate and uh, interactions between the terrestrial and atmospheric branches of the hydrological cycle. Um, Paul, uh, we're looking very forward to your talk, and it is so nice to not only look only at the ocean and the atmosphere, but also the other components which do play a role in estuary's predictability. Uh, go ahead, Paul. Well, thank you, Judith and uh, Anish, again, for giving me a second chance to speak. Hopefully, you see the full screen presentation. I trust it's working all right. Um, I'm going to end up in very much the same place as, as the questions that Andy just answered so well. So, um, but the starting point, just to, as a reminder to the students, and it's been four weeks now, there's been so much coming past you, um, just to kind of reorient that for the land surface, what we're really looking for here is when and where is the land surface important to atmosphere, weather, and climate, because it's not important in all places and all locations. The uh, and all times. It's very similar to to ENSO, to the El Nino phenomenon. You can think people, even the general public now knows to sort of pay attention to SSTs in the tropical Pacific, that somehow that has some connection to weather and climate all over the globe, over the US, especially in the winter time, right? We, that's a, something that we really focus on and maybe not so much in the summer. It's kind of a similar situation with the land surface, but the, the, the pathways are a bit different. In uh, S2S forecasting, subseasonal to seasonal climate anomalies are driven by, as you've been hearing for weeks, these sort of persistent large scale circulation features. That's what we really hang our hat on. It's really these long atmospheric waves that have remote sources from the, uh, the MJO or from the tropics or even coming down from the stratosphere. Communicated, as it were, to where we live, which is basically most of us living on continents, we're not living in the middle of the tropical Pacific Ocean, uh, where we live on continents, it's Rossby wave propagation, right? That's carrying the signal to us. And so predictable S2S phenomenon are sort of delivered by the atmosphere to where we live in much the same way that you might say, you know, a freight company is delivering your Amazon order or that your internet service provider is delivering you data to your house. So if we think of this analogy, then we can think of the atmosphere as being that sort of large scale shipping, but then like the communications or shipping where things often break down is that last mile, that last kilometer to your house, right? Once the package is in your neighborhood, 30% of the cost and most of the failures in this kind of shipping or, or in ISPs occur in your neighborhood at that final step to the customer's door. And so this is a very similar analogy that we would post for forecast models. If the land surface in your neighborhood, in your country, in your state, in your continent is poorly initialized, or if the coupled land atmosphere processes are not well represented, then the delivery breaks down or is lost or is garbled. And so we've kind of transitioned from this uh, dynamics, fluid dynamics picture with the atmosphere down to something local that's a lot more thermodynamics that we're talking about with the land surface and the atmosphere above it and it becomes much more of a regional thermodynamic problem. So uh, a quick review, a quick reminder, kind of where we stand right now. About 20 years ago, the, the Glossé experiment revealed this notion of hotspots of land atmosphere coupling or feedbacks that tend to be in these transition regions between arid and humid locations. And so these, um, these hotspots were found initially through modeling studies only without observational data because we didn't have the observational data at the time. Um, and so the way this was determined in models was basically through a very clever design of a model experiment where we run a large ensemble of simulations. And in one case, all the ensemble members are initialized identically with the same land surface state. And when the other one, they're all sort of jumbled up they're all sort of randomized or, or, or something is done differently. And so when we do that, we can look at the coherence within an ensemble 
as a measure of the feedback, this omega parameter shown here. So the idea is basically that when you have an ensemble and you specify the land surface to be identical in all the ensemble members and specify it you know, potentially throughout the entire integration, then if the land surface is actually controlling the atmosphere, then the atmosphere should be kind of more constrained, more coherent, less spread in the ensemble members. They should track each other more closely. If the land surface states have no bearing on it, then it won't change that spread at all. And the ensemble will spread just as it did when you just did an initialization or just you know randomized surface. So coherence is a hint of predictability and an increase in coherence, say when you specify the same land surface state, says, ah, this could be a source of predictability. And this coherence then can potentially carry the signal in time uh, to the subseasonal to seasonal distances. So in our Glossé case, this omega increased the spread. When you increase the spread in land surface states, it increases the spread in your ensemble forecast. And that was our clue. That's basically what this map is telling us. A quick reminder just on the processes, we see this as links in a chain. So for instance, the little pseudo equation at the bottom there, um, if you have an increase in rainfall, then you're gonna have an increase in soil moisture that has the potential to lead to increase in evaporation. More moisture in the atmosphere might lead to more increase in rainfall or sustaining the rainfall. That's the positive feedback idea. And what we talked about before was when you have a high positive correlation between soil moisture and evaporation, that means you're in a moisture limited regime. Variations in soil moisture are controlling the evaporation. Um, when you have an energy limited re regime where you have a lot of water in the soil, but maybe not enough sunlight, it's not warm enough, then it's actually the energy availability that's the limiting factor. And that's what controls evaporation. And then soil moisture is kind of along for the ride and it becomes negatively correlated. That's what we see in that middle panel. But for that to get communicated to the atmosphere, the atmosphere has to be ready and it has to play along. And so the atmosphere has to be in a state where it's responsive to a change in surface fluxes. And if all the pieces of the puzzle are in place, then that's when soil moisture can control things like boundary layer depth, cloud formation, and the amount of rainfall. We saw that that sensitivity does not occur in all ranges of soil moisture. There's a particular range where we have a lot of sensitivity that's kind of outlined in red here, kind of moderate amounts of soil moisture in the soil, not too wet, not too dry, Goldilocks sort of zone. Above some amount, the moisture in the soil uh, is, is so high that again, evaporation levels off. All the variation in evaporation is about the energy availability, not the water availability. And likewise, at the low ends, uh, we can shut down to a point where there's basically no evaporation. And again, this is all thermodynamics. It's not dynamics. How these feedbacks occur is, is through this pathway. And as soon as the sun comes up, you have energy potentially to evaporate moisture. So if you're in that red box, then you're, you're sort of ready to go. The slope of that line is the sensitivity. Uh, the stronger the slope, then the more surface fluxes change with the change in soil wetness. And we pointed out before that the atmospheric part also has different ranges of, of response. And again, kind of the medium range of evaporation is where precipitation seems to be most sensitive. Again, you know, not too hard, not too soft. The bed is just right for Goldilocks. Glossé 2 was our prediction version of Glossé, not a predictability experiment, but actually doing hindcasts. It was kind of like S2S before S2S uh, prediction project. And so what we saw there was that realistic soil moisture initialization improves the forecasts. And so what you see on the right here is temperature prediction skill. Um, the dots are significant areas. Yellow is good. Lead time is the different rows. But here I'm also showing that the extremes really contribute to prediction skill. So when we look at the extreme terciles or the quintiles are on the far right, the deciles, the top 10% wettest and driest soils are contributing almost all of the skill that we see in the whole range just like a strong El Nino or a strong La Nina is where we get most of our seasonal predictability. When El Nino is weak, eh, it's hard to, hard to get a forecast. Same thing applies for soil moisture. So the skill impacts are also longer where there's that memory, where there's that persistence of a soil moisture anomaly. 
it just happens to turn out over North America that the hot spot where the coupling is the strongest is also a place where the memory is weak. So we see in these maps that the Great Plains kind of fades away after 30 days, 45 days, and is no longer an area of predictable temperature. The coupling is strong there, but the memory of the soil moisture anomalies just isn't there. Okay, so this all affects prediction skill in Glossae 2. And as we said before, a quick reminder, if you're in kind of a dry area, where it's typically kind of too dry to have much evaporation and you have a wet spell, oh, suddenly you've moved into that sensitive range. Likewise, if you're in kind of a wet area where it's usually too wet for the variations in soil moisture to affect surface fluxes and have the response, but you go into kind of a dry phase, oh, now suddenly that area is in a sensitive regime. And so in each case, if you're in that area with the strong slope of surface fluxes as a function of soil wetness, then you can have land atmosphere interactions and potential predictability and potential prediction skill to harvest. A great example of that wet area getting dry and suddenly being able to give a feedback is what we saw in Northern Europe in 2018 during the drought and heat wave in, in that region. And we saw this plot before too, a couple of weeks ago, the uh, temperature extremes, in this case, it's the fraction of days in May, June, and July, August of 2018 that were among the 5% of the warmest days for the whole 40-year uh, period leading up to that time. And in the bottom, it's, it's for soil moisture, although we're taking the top quarter, the top quartile, instead of the top 5%. And what we said was that there is kind of on the bottom of that scale, there's the place where the the uh, evaporation basically shuts down and any energy, any, any net radiation at the surface goes into sensible heat flux and just gets pumped right back in the atmosphere as heat. That's this critical threshold, this break point where we can really get an amplification in the strength of a heat wave because the land atmosphere feedbacks have now sort of cranked it up to 11. And so that's kind of shown in, in the bottom here, uh, bottom left figure. But to kind of expand on that, intensification idea. So effectively, when you drop below, if you know any soil hydrology, when you drop below the wilting point, uh, when, when plants become very stressed and basically shut down and stop trying to do um, um, uh, any sort of photosynthesis and thus are also not transpiring any moisture through the atmosphere, that's when we get this really strong feedback. And that threshold depends on the type of soil that you have. It depends on the type of vegetation. The map on the left shows this climatological threshold that we've deduced over Europe for that soil moisture shutdown. And there's a lot of spatial variability. It's not just a function of latitude or, or, or anything. Uh, and all that fine structure is because of different vegetation, different soils in those different locations. Even orography can affect this. And the hypersensitivity of the maximum temperatures on declining soil moisture is shown on the right. The darker the colors, the more quickly temperatures will ramp up as you cross down and dry out the soil by some uh, increment of, of wetness. And so you see dark colors in places like in, in Iberia, uh, in, uh, in Turkey, over Ukraine, even in sort of northern France around Paris. There's that band in southern Britain, for instance, that you see that has the darker colors. That's the area where they have chalk soils or chalk underneath the soils. It's kind of a karst formation, which has a very different interaction with, with the, uh, the vegetation and, and the soils above it than further north in Britain, where you kind of have a typical bedrock substrate underneath. So all these things have an effect, even the geology. We talked about that the time scale where this really emerges is in the S2S range. I showed this picture before and compared it to our um, idealized schematic. It shows the land sort of peaking in the subseasonal range. There's not a lot of impact of land or ocean at very short time scales because it's all an initial condition problem of the atmosphere. All the skill comes from the atmosphere. There's not much room left to improve the skill with the land or the ocean. But once you get out five days, a week, two weeks, three weeks, suddenly it becomes, from the atmospheric perspective, a boundary value problem, not an initial value problem. But from the land or the ocean, no, what do you mean boundary? It's us, There's, the atmosphere is our boundary. To them, it's still an initial value problem. It's what was the initial soil moisture? What's the initial SSTs? 
if you think about it as a system, which is the way we should think about it, as you know, Andy mentioned, uh, then you have to look at the whole picture and realize that it's, it's a coupled feedback. And you just have different components that have different memories and different uh, scales to, to persist their initial states. So this land impact on prediction skill here, we're showing it actually quantified. Um, a realistic initialization, initialization of the land surface can extend significant skill and prediction of air temperatures. In this case, we're looking at pentads. What we see here is that how many pentads is significant skill extended beyond what we had before by using the right land initialization instead of say random or climatological initialization. About 40% of the land area of the globe has skill extended by at least two pentads, 10 days or more. About 80%, at least five days or more extended by doing these pentad averages, which suggests neglecting initialization is going to be a big problem for forecast skill. And we can also look at it kind of the way the CPC always looks at you know, monthly chunks. If we look at month one, month two, month three, then we see a similar picture that 30 to 50% of the globe has skill extended by at least one month looking at temperature and here also humidity and dry season subtropics three months or more. And this is with the old CFS version two, which is not a state of the art model. It's a really kind of a kind of an old beater of a model at this point. It's kind of been in use for uh, nearly 15 years now. The new UFS model that's being developed has a potential to improve upon this by improving the models as well, not just the initialization. Um, let me skip this one. I want to get to the initialization question. Assimilating soil moisture. This came up uh, in the last couple of talks about soil moisture. So this is actually showing information content. This is from information theory um, in, of soil moisture in these different products. The x-axis is called metric entropy. If it's really high, then you basically got noise, random noise. If it's really low on the left side, zero means it's periodic. And somewhere in between is kind of a mix of the two. The y-axis is the complexity in the signal, how much information content is there. And what we see is that in situ measurements of soil moisture outlined here in blue, um, what you have is, is the, our kernel density, our, 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 high in, our high blob here is really, it's not too noisy, it's not too periodic, it's got a lot of information. When we look at the models, they kind of rep replicate that to some extent. They're a little too periodic, a little too deterministic. Our models, you know, they tend to have trouble expanding and getting the whole envelope. Um, but what we see here is that the, the satellites, the old satellites that we used to have for soil moisture, which were not purpose built to measure soil moisture, mostly are just noise. There's not a whole lot of information in them. The SMAP satellite from NASA, soil moisture, it's still got a lot of noise, but man, it looks so much better. And in fact, the information content looks very useful and much more comparable to in situ measurements, which is really giving us a lot of promise for initializing the land globally. A lot of forecast centers already do land data assimilation of satellite soil moisture data for initialization. ECMWF did this starting with ERA2 and does it operationally. So does uh, Meteo France does it, um, KMA does it, uh, uh, Environment Canada does it. Um, some places don't do it, <clears throat> and so it's gonna be a couple of years before they get their system going, but eventually that will come in. Okay, so to wrap up, land models and atmosphere models have been developed separately and sort of plugged together. It's a system. We need to consider model development as a system. The coupling is very important. It's important for predictability and prediction. Until recently, we didn't have a lot of data, either the in situ or the satellite data of good enough quality, of good enough coverage to really do this sort of validation. But now we can, and now we're starting to do that. And so this is a picture I like to show. Nature, land and atmosphere are involved in this, in this beautiful, elegant dance going back and forth. And our models historically have not represented this in a very elegant, uh, realistic fashion. But now we have a chance to model nature much better and improve our S2S predictions, which is really where the land could have a lot of impact because it is a coupled system. And I will stop there. Oh, one thing, uh, here's the references that were, were cited in the previous slides. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, very comprehensive, very educational. Thank you so much. I, 
Uh, I have a question. So please post your questions or raise your hands. Um, but I wanted to ask you about uncertainty. So we, yes. we often have that problem in, in the atmosphere that we're under dispersive, and that problem gets probably worse on the S2S scale. Um, and I was wondering um, if you could say about the uncertainty sort of in the land parameters, and if you have enough observation to constrain them, do you have that same problem of under dispersion? And in that context, can you talk a little bit about um, subject scale heterogeneity? Yes, uh, wow, that is a lot in that question. <laughs> uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, you under dispersive is the right term, and we have exactly that same situation with the land surface. Um, parameter choosing is a big problem, um, as is the case with, say, you know, rainfall data and so many other things. We have a lot of information in the developed world. Uh, so, you know, Europe, North America, East Asia, Australia, we have a lot of good data on soil parameters, you know, in situ that have been gathered and so forth and vegetation. We don't in a lot of parts of the world. We have to rely on satellites uh, to give us the global coverage. And then there's the usual problems of interpreting the satellite data. Although some clever people have worked out ways to try to back out the kind of information we need from the variability they see in long satellite records. Um, but it's still a little bit kludgy in that regard. Uh, one thing I didn't point out, but is relevant to the heterogeneity is that when we do the in situ validation, that's a site. And even if you have a flux tower, that flux tower kind of has a footprint of at most a square kilometer, usually on the areas of, you know, uh, thousands of square meters, which is much smaller than any of our, our model grids. So there's also the concern about scale. And heterogeneity is always an issue. It doesn't matter how, how fine you go with your model, there are always scales that are finer than your highest resolution. And um, for the land surface in particular, surface heterogeneity can drive mesoscale circulations, which can contribute upscale to a lot of what we see at the grid scale and are simply not resolved. Um, in our climate models, especially. Getting to these convection permitting or cloud permitting scales of models has, it has a lot of promise. It's going to help quite a bit, but there's still heterogeneity uh, below those scales potentially that could be important. And we have actually right now um, a, a, a CPT climate process team project with NOAA to look at heterogeneity in the land surface and how that affects the atmosphere. Actually, two projects. There's another one that looks at heterogeneity in atmospheric radiation and how that affects the land surface. And so we're actually trying to address that to create a sort of uh, subgrid land surface parameterization kind of on the scale of what we have in atmospheric models now for convection, like CLUB, for instance, um, that can be used and, and coupled to the subgrid uh, unresolved uh, convection models so that we can get the, the land surface drivers more correctly done in our in our core scale models. Yeah, and if I, if I might uh, comment, I've been involved in a few um, collaborations uh, with NOAA where we looked at perturbing the parameters in the in the land model in the hurry at the time. And uh, unfortunately, we introduced huge biases um, when we perturb things like hydraulic conductivity and so in our experience, it was beneficial to perturb the initial condition, but not to, um, I mean, the idea was representing um, subject scale heterogeneity. The, the bias was just too big to, um, to, to be more beneficial <laughs> um, mm. than the representation of uncertainty. Um, Jan has a question, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Um, <clears throat> my question was a little bit in the direction of the one plot you, where you showed the predictability on S to S time scales and that comes initially from the atmosphere and then the land service kind of on the second probably to fifth week time scale. And in the context of this high sensitivity of the soil moisture to heating to changing atmospheric conditions. Um, and that you showed over Europe, for example. Um, and uh, my question is a little bit, okay, I'm trying to phrase it well. Um, so if we can predict, for example, blocking over, over Europe better, so we increase our prediction of the atmosphere 
um, on those time scales up to two weeks does that would that have an impact then on on the land processes i hope oh, certainly and, yeah and increased predictability potentially i hope that came across as yeah no good. yes no certainly and because it's a coupled system so um in order to get the soil moisture forecast correct three four or five weeks out in advance you would like to have the right rainfall, you would like to have the right temperature and net radiation at the surface, and that would come from having a better atmospheric prediction. You'd like the clouds to be correct. So, and then in, in so doing, then if you have the correct soil moisture, that could then feed back and, and help improve the atmospheric states. So yes, very much so that, you know, the places where we do have the land controlling the atmosphere, you would like the land states to be correct. We talked about there being that sort of break point where you have the higher sensitivity in a, in a heat wave or a drought. You would like your model to be on the left or right side of that break point when reality is on the right or left side of that break point. Or you'd like it to cross that threshold the same time your forecasts cross the threshold, the same time the real world is crossing the threshold. So these are the kind of details that we're that we're looking at. So yeah, I mean it's I have this, you know, cynical thing. I say that a, a, a forecast model is just a carefully balanced uh, set of errors, and when you correct and remove one error, then all the other errors are upset and start manifesting. So um, you really have to look at all the pieces of the puzzle. You can't just put all the blame on one component or or all the the attempt to to correct a bad forecast on one component. It's all connected. Thank you. Thanks so much. I should memorize that one. <laughs> and <Andy, laughs> um, go ahead. So, yeah, I have a question back related to your uh, coupling work. And yes. first of all, a uh, very nice presentation. It's always interesting to see this, even parts I've seen before. Um, so, enjoyable. Um, so, in the coupling <clears throat> aspect, you mentioned that one of the key pieces is that memory, you know, where you have strong coupling and where you have strong memory. Right. You need to predictability, but do you think that our models uh, are evaluated to see if their, their memory is correct or not? I mean, do we know that they tend to have good memory due to whatever parameters and configuration? Yeah, now that, that that's something that we we're starting to look at, or I should say starting, we've been doing this for some time, where we have in situ soil moisture me measurements, mm -hmm. um, we have been evaluating soil moisture memory and comparing that to models. Uh, the, again, where are most of the measurements? It's, it's in the US, it's in Europe, it's in Australia, it's in China, mm -hmm. um, places like, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, where there's where this where soil moisture is such a critical component, we know from modeling studies, we just we don't have data in those locations. We've got some satellite data now. Um, SMAP has only been up for five six years now, so it's kind of hard. We're just sort of barely getting to the threshold where we might start to have enough data to hang some significance on that. Um, mm -hmm. I think as time goes forward, we'll be collecting more and more. Uh, satellite data and we can make a better assessment of memory but yeah persistence of anomalies is a problem oh and one problem with the satellite i didn't mention uh these microwave based uh satellites uh, is that they're only seeing a couple of centimeters of the soil and if you got much vegetation at all they're really just seeing the water in the vegetation and not even seeing the soil so mm -hmm. what's going on subsurface is much more of a mystery and not easily addressed by satellite so yeah. As you well know. Great. Anish, is that yeah, a new hand, hand or the old hand? <laughs> it's a new hand. <laughs> um, so, yeah, my question is uh, I was recalling the study from GFDL. I think Gabe, Becky, and group had the study on the ENSO teleconnection in the 2015 16 case and how the teleconnection was not the canonical teleconnection on the Western US that the uh, Southwest US was not wet and um, the opposite yeah. in the Pacific Northwest. And they showed that the land initialization on the seasonal time scale played a big role in, in getting the teleconnection right, at least with the GFDL model, right? I was wondering, so how much is the land surface, land atmosphere coupling a function of um, the regime dependence, especially over Western US. 
And do we understand that fully and how much it modulates the answer teleconnections into US? Yeah, I can, I don't know about that. That's the specific case of the Western US, but certainly, um, yes, that, that, that has to do with the thermodynamic state of the atmosphere and whether it's responsive to, to variations in the land surface. And that can be controlled to some extent by whether you're in a ridge or a trough, for instance, okay. they're gonna have different, different responses, different stabilities, different uh, uh, profiles of moist static energy or dry static energy. So yes, it's, it, it is all connected. And, and furthermore, some of these large land uh, anomalies, large in magnitude as well as extent, particularly when they are over elevated terrain, such as well, in the US it would be over the Western US, over the Rocky Mountains, or the, the, the canonical example is the Tibetan Plateau. When you have a, an anomaly in land surface states on elevated terrain, it's kind of effectively putting any heating anomalies up into the middle troposphere right away. So it's kind of similar to having an, an El Nino signal. And there can be a lot more response to the atmosphere and teleconnection patterns from the land surface anomalies in those locations. Yeah. The Bolivian Altiplano is, is the third area in the world that kind of has this large region where you could have that. When you have a similar, say, temperature anomaly or, or humidity anomaly at land that's near sea level, it, it just doesn't get up into the atmosphere enough to affect anything but sort of the local and the regional areas. It doesn't create a, a planetary scale wave. But when you have the anomalies on elevated terrain, it can. So that's another thing that's actually relatively new, just in the last uh, few years have people started looking at that. And there's an LS4P project that Yung Kang Shui at UCLA is leading that's really looking into that and doing some, some really interesting modeling studies. Great, thanks. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, I don't see any hands. Um, so um, this concludes our day for today. Thank you so much, Paul, for giving us Thank your perspective. You. And um, uh, I see everyone tomorrow at 9 a.m. for the last day of the workshop. Thanks to all the speakers and all the good questions from the audience. See you tomorrow. <laughs>